Hi, I'm Mr. Williamson. In this video, we're going to talk about cells. Most of the information that you were about to give you, you were supposed to have learned in the seventh grade, but I'm going to review it because I know it's not fresh in your mind. This would be a good time to get out your notebook, take notes. Cornell style is always good. Let's get started. A quick history, and in my class, you don't need to worry about history. I'm not going to test you on the history of things. But I think it's important that you understand how we got to where we are and, and how do we learn what we learn. So in 1663, Robert Hoch, using a simple microscope, and you can see the microscope down here, all right, um, uh, looked at cork, cork like you find in a wine bottle. Um, and he, all what he saw was little boxes, and he thought of them, they looked like, like prison cells, and so he called them cells. Um, and because his microscope wasn't very good, he thought that the only thing they were full of was juices, okay, and that's what he called them. So he called them, he was the one who, who discovered cells, and, and he figured that they were all just full of juices, all right? In 1831, again, you think about this, this is about 30 years before our Civil War, um, Robert Brown was the first to discover the cell nucleus. The microscopes were getting better. Our microscope that we would use in school um, is, is actually good enough to see the nucleus of most cells. And then 1838, Matthias Schleiden announced that all plant tissue is composed of cells. In other words, he was the one that came up with the idea that all plant tissue is made of cells. Well, obviously, if all plant tissue is made of cells, the next step is to announce that all animal tissue is made of cells, and that's what happened in 1839 when Theodore Schwann announced that all animal tissue is composed of cells. Um, in 1840, J. Purkinje introduced the idea of uh, protoplasm, which is the actual the term for Hooke's uh, uh, juices in the cell. And in 1858, Rudolf Virchow said, ominous cellula e cellula, which basically means every cell comes from the cell. All right, uh, which is part of the cell theory. And, and it's actually uh, Virchow, Virchow uh, Schwann, and Schleiden that are, are credited with the today's modern cell theory. The cell theory is basically that all living things are composed of one or more cells. If it does not have a cell, it is not living. Now, that I did not include into the characteristics of life uh, when I talked about it because it's kind of a given. Um, but all living things are made of at least one cell. Uh, the cell is the basic unit of life, kind of like the atom is the basic unit of matter. You can't get any smaller than an atom and still have matter. Um, the cell is the smallest thing that is still alive. We can have organelles, just like we can have electrons, protons, and neutrons in an atom, but we can't have anything smaller than a cell and still have it be alive. All cells arise from existing cells. All cells come from previously existing cells. They do not appear magically. That's, that's the, the third part of the cell theory. And, and that's kind of important. You should probably note the cell theory. That's a note there. I said that. Here's the thing to remember that when we're talking about cells. They're not static. Static means that they're, they're stationary. All right? They're always moving. They're always changing. I can show you thousands of diagrams of cells and, and, and hundreds of thousands of pictures of cells, and no cell in the world will ever look like any of the ones I showed you. That's, the diagram is just an idealized picture of a cell, all right? The picture, a photograph, is what that cell looked like at that moment in time, all right? The, the, the cell is always in flux. It's always changing. It's, it's, in, in, it's changing shape. It's changing volume. In some cases, it's actually pulsing. There are substances going into the cell. There are substances going out of the cell. Um, so it has to be studied one moment at a time, which is why we show, I show you pictures or I show you a diagram. Um, again, it's kind of like you. I could I could take a a, a photograph, or it's, let's start with a diagram. I can I can do a diagram of a human being and say, oh look, there's a human being, and and I think everybody would accept that I just drew a human being. Okay, it's a stick figure, but it's a human being. All right, there's no human in the world that looks like this, and yet when I draw it, you guys all go, yeah, it's a human being. I get it. All right. I could show you a picture of you, uh, any picture. Pick one of the ones on your social media accounts. You don't look like that. You looked like that for that one moment that you took the picture. But you don't look like that now because of exactly the same thing. You are changing shape. You are changing volume. Your things are going into and out of you. All right? Um, 
and and so we we study the cell like we study you a photograph we study that one moment of time here's here's two different kinds of cells um actually they're the same kind of cell different angle the one on the left over here um is is skin cells all right that's from the top that's what if we looked under a microscope at your skin from the surface it would look like that if we looked at a cross section in other words we took the skin and we cut it off and took a cross section it would look like this those are cells but you look those are all skin cells at least they are in this area okay those are all skin cells but none of them are the same so i can't show you one particular skin cell here you have on the on the the left you have um, cells that are in the digestive system, in the intestine, uh, and on the right are cardiac cells, cells in the heart. And again, you could look at each one of these, and you would not see any of the two that are identical. They look similar, but they're not identical. And then finally, we have on the left fat cells, and on the right bone cells. All right, um, and and none of them are the same. So we have to, you have to understand that we're, we're, we're studying cells in a very um, fluid type of a situation. But to do that, I'm going to show you diagrams or I'm going to show you pictures. And that's that one moment. Okay, it's the one thing that it looked like at that at the moment. But they're, they're general uh, descriptions. So first thing we're going to talk about is prokaryotic versus eukaryotic because there are two kinds of cells. Um, prokaryotic cells are like bacteria. I think that's probably the, the most important part here is they are they are bacteria. All right. That's it's they're simple. Pro means early. All right. So they're prokaryotic cells. Um, meaning that they, they are very simple. And you can see what they contain basically is um, they complain contain DNA. They don't have a nucleus. They have no membrane bound organelles. They have cytoplasm. They have ribosomes. Um, they have a cell wall, they have a cell, a plasma membrane, and they have a flagellum. Some of them, not all of them, even have a flagellum. But there's no, there's no mitochondria, there's no nucleus. Um, they do have ribosomes, which are not, uh, which are organelles, but they're not membrane bound. In other words, it does not have any cell, uh, any membrane around anything except for the the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is this this membrane that surrounds the cell. They're all bacteria cells prokaryotic cells are bacteria cells you don't think of that when i say the word cell when i say the word cell you're thinking of something like this a eukaryotic cell all right they are complex they have membrane bound organelles uh it's thought that they evolved from prokaryotic cells and they're the cells like it says here that you think of when i talk about cell when i say the word cell you picture something like this all right or a plant cell okay this is a quick review of, of, of remember from the themes of biology the the multicellular organization and and we can go from an atom like i did before adam and put a bunch of those to molecule covalent bonds uh, and make a molecule we can make macromolecules like lipids and carbohydrates and uh, amino acids and nucleic acids we can take those biological molecules and we can make an organelle one small part of a cell we can take a bunch of cells Put them together and make a bunch of organelles put them together and get a cell if we take the same kind of cells we get a tissue which are all the same kind of cells like for instance muscle tissue or or nerve tissue if we take um a bunch of different tissues we come up with an organ stomach in this case we put some organs together you get an organ system which is a, a group of organs that work together to perform one task for the body and then you pick the organ systems and we get an organism the entire organism all right. And now a cell, a cell could be an organism. It, it's possible. But in this case, we're looking at the multicellular organization. So I want you to understand where cells fit in. They are living. Okay. This is the start of the living things. Down below that, not living. All right. So let's talk about the parts of the cell. And, and like I said at the beginning, this is something you're supposed to have learned in the seventh grade. If you don't know it, then you might want to take some time to review it. Hopefully, as I go through it, uh, you, you go, oh, yeah, I remember that. Um, and I hopefully I'm giving you some more information, information that will help you remember it and, and learn it in a more advanced fashion. Number one, let's talk about the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is basically everything in the cell that is not an organelle. Okay, it's the juice. Uh, Robert Hoch was right. It's, it's the juice of the cell. 
All right. Now it could do, it may work in cytoplasmic streaming, which is movement of the cytoplasm. And we see that once in a while in plants. Uh, if we were in the classroom, I would show you um, cytoplasmic streaming in a, a plant under the microscope. You would actually see it. Um, but it's, it's the cytoplasm. It's everything in between the, the organelles. All right. Uh, the mitochondria, the thing that everybody remembers from high school, it's the powerhouse of the cell. Well, it is basically, and I'm not going to go into, you know, the, the details. I'm not going to read all this to you. It's, it's where ATP is formed. It has two membranes, and there's, there's one here, one here, and then there's an inner membrane here. And you're almost always going to see this as a drawn like a bean, kind of like this, and then some kind of squiggly thing in the middle. Or maybe you're going to see it like this and, and kind of something like that. If you see something like that, it's prob prob probably a mitochondria. And the function of it, like it says, is the site of respiration. It should be of, not or. Site of respiration uh, uh, of ATP. Okay? Or, yeah, not or. Site of respiration or ATP production. Now, the question you probably should have is, what's ATP? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. This is what a mitochondria actually looks up, looks like under an electron microscope. All right, and you can see the the outer um, membrane here. All right, let's try if I can find a color you can see better. There we go. All right, that's the outer membrane, and then you can see the inner membranes right here. So that's why I drew it, like I said, kind of a a, a bean shaped thing. Sometimes you'll see it like this. No, mitochondria. Another picture of mitochondria. The mitochondria in this case are are these right here that are there's one, there's one, there's one. This is one again, electron microscope. There you go. I don't have an any idea what this is. I have no idea what that is. But those are the purple ones, uh, drawn circled ones are the the mitochondria. ATP. What does it, it makes ATP? Mitochondria makes ATP. You don't have to know this. There's an entire unit, next unit coming up. It's called. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's the battery molecule of the cell. We do not burn ATP. It stores energy. We're going to learn about it next unit. Don't worry about it. But you do need to know the mitochondria makes ATP. It's the site of ATP production. Lysosomes, another organelle. Single layer. They are membrane bound. Um, they're used basically to digest food, to digest organelles that are no longer working, and to actually digest the cell. It's, if the cell's damaged, the lysosomes will erupt and they have digestive enzymes inside of them, and they will um, digest the cells or cell, organ, or, or cell parts. Or they could, uh, like it says, or could uh, digest um, food. All right. There is a theory, actually, it's down here, the hand stump theory, that during uh, embryonic development, your hand starts to kind of look like, your starts out looking like this, and the lysosomes actually dissolve away the parts of your hand that don't look like a hand. So it actually takes out all of this and, and dissolves all that until you do have a hand. That's the hand stump theory in, in embryology, but it's done through lysosomes and the digestive enzymes they contain. All right, microfilaments are, are filaments. They're, they're strings. Think of it more like a string kind of thing. And you can see them over here, all right, where they are in the cell. Here in the cell, they're along the edges, all right, and, and they're, they give structure to the cell, all right? Not, nothing real major. They're made of protein, give structure to the cell. Microtubules, all right, are the ones that you can see over here, and they're more inside the cell, and they maintain shape. It's a tube. Think of it like a girder in a, a or, or or beam, a structural support in a in a building. They 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 give shape to the cell. All right, um, centrioles are located in only in animal cells. Very close to, to in association with the nucleus, so you're going to see them very close to the nucleus, and they're going to form spindle fibers during cell division, during mitosis. Uh, we talk about that near the end of the semester, but found only in animal cells, um, and they're they're in, involved in in uh, mitosis or the splitting of a cell. Cilia and flagella. I don't talk a lot about them in class. Um, you can see they are are found in. Um, Protozoa, single cell organisms, that's a paramecium. They have like thousands of, of small cilia um, but, uh, and, and to, for movement. 
Uh, by the way, Sealy and Flagell are the exact same thing, just Sealy is really short, Flagell is really long. And you can see down here, um, a, a, a some sort, this could be a, a, a bacteria, but it's probably a protozoan of some sort, different arrangements that Flagella could have. And so instance, for instance, on this one, it might that that flagella might actually act like a propeller on a plane and pull the 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 organism through um, the the medium the water or whatever and and the middle picture here is just to show you this is a very detailed uh, um, diagram of how they work you don't need to know this don't worry about it but it almost works like a motor if you know how an electric motor works works kind of the same way in flagella and cilia we do have flagella and cilia like in our, our nasal passages and our our, our bronchial tubes to help move um, um, debris and, and uh, contaminants out of our lungs and our, our air passageways. And that's what happens when you smoke, you ruin those and those debris and that those contaminants don't get washed up, they continue down into the lungs. But we do have them in some, some parts of our body, but mostly they're found in, in individual cells, protozoa and things like that. The nucleus. It's the one thing that most kids know uh, what it is. It's the control center. It's really not a control center. It does not control anything. It stores the DNA. It's the largest organelle in the cell. And you can see it here. This is what would be a, an onion cell here, um, up on the top, stained. They, they've, they have actually added some stain to these. All right. The actual onion cell are, is this part here. All right. And the nucleus is the purple dot. All right, now you can actually, I don't know if you can see this, just a little thing. That one right there is actually dividing. Um, it's getting ready to divide, and it's in a stage called uh, metaphase. And we're going to talk about that, like I said, at the end of the semester. Down the bottom, you can see uh, these are probably cheek cells. We used to do this lab in uh, the, the classroom. Unfortunately, it involves uh, human uh, uh, fluids, body fluids, saliva, and we're not allowed to do that anymore, but that's, you can see the... The individual, I think this is actually two cells right here, and those are the, the nucleus right there. Those are the, the, those little darker spots in the nucleus. They stain them with a stain to make them show up better. Um, the form, all right, it is a bilipid layer. And we're going to talk about bilipid layers a little later in the, in the unit. Um, but it has a bilipid layer and it has pores. So you can see the pores right here. And that's to allow the RNA to, get, to move out of the, the nucleus. And I'm going to talk about that in uh, two units. Um, but it has pores. It has um, a nucleolus, which we'll talk about right now. Um, after this, we'll talk about the nucleus in just a minute. Uh, basically, it directs the, what's the function of the nucleus. It contains the chromosomes and the nucleolus. All right. It doesn't really direct the functions of the cell. That's probably not real well phrased. The, the, the chromosomes contain the DNA, and the DNA codes for proteins. And that's what controls what happens inside the cell. All right. So chromosomes, you don't need to know this. It's not real detail. We're going to go into a lot of detail in two units. But uh, mostly DNA and some protein. It's where all of your genetic material is stored is in a chromosome. It's kind of like a packaging body for the DNA. It allows just to pack up the DNA and keep it all nice and neat rather than un loose and unwound. Think of it like if you had a whole couple balls of string and you just unrolled them and all put them into a box, it's hard to get to use it. But if you keep it uh, rolled up like on spools, you can use it. Chromosomes are those spools. The nucleolus, as I said earlier, is this part right here. It's a little ball inside of the nucleus, um, and it is responsible for making uh, ribosomes. All right, it, R, it's called rRNA. It makes rRNA, which are ribosomes, and the ribosomes produce protein. Matter of fact, that's what we're talking about next: is the ribosome. Um, two units. All right. Uh, there's a large unit and a small uh, unit. So there's the, the large subunit and the small subunit. Um, that's where proteins are made. Um, they are found in two places in the cell. They're either found free-floating in the, the, nucle uh, in the cytoplasm, um, which is, means that if they make proteins, they're going to make proteins for inside the cell. If they're attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, they're going to make proteins for outside the cell. All right? But the ribosome is basically just the site of protein synthesis. Two units from now, we'll talk about it. Endoplasmic reticulum, seeing as I just talked about it, what is it? It's a bilipid layer. Again, we'll talk about bilipid layers a little bit later this unit. Um, but it is, it is a, a kind of like, a, think of it as a, 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 a assembly line for mostly proteins. If the, 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 the ribosomes are attached to it, which you can see right here, every one of these little dots 
that you see on a on a cell is a ribosome okay and down below you can see this um electro electron uh, microscope uh photograph of the the, the endoplasmic reticulum these are the endoplasmic reticulum parts right there the lines and the ribosomes are the little dots that you see attached in onto them all right so endoplasmic reticulum it's just a, a an assembly line for um proteins mostly proteins in the um for, for the cell all right while we're talking about uh, cellular and extracellular proteins cellular proteins are the ones that are made from ribosomes that are free floating in the the cytoplasm and that would be for making proteins that the cell is actually going to use if it's the, the ribosomes attached to endoplasmic reticulum then it's this a protein that's going to be used outside the cell think about like my example here think about like saliva okay there's a lot of enzymes in saliva that start digestive process. One of them is amylase. I talked about it last unit. Um, amylase breaks down starch. Uh, so, so how do we get the protein into the saliva? Well, endoplasmic reticulum has all the, the ribosomes attached to it. So when it makes um, those proteins, they're all packaged up and, and released outside the cell so that, that they can be used outside the cell in the body, all right? How do they get outside the cell? So this thing called the Golgi body. Um, they have, if you look at it, it's a, the form of it is kind of like little smaller and smaller plates. This is the larger plate uh, from the side, I guess. If we looked at it from the side, you have a large plate and then you have a smaller plate, a smaller plate and a smaller plate until you get to the top where you just get this single vesicle. And a vesicle is just a ball that's going to travel to the, the um, cell membrane and, and move out. And the reason that they're getting smaller is because these little parts here are, are separating out. They're, they're kind of, it's actually got a technical term called blebbing. Yes, B-L-E-B-B-I-N-G, blebbing. No, you don't need to know it. Don't worry about it. That's the term. Somebody came up with that and said, oh, we'll call it blebbing. But as you pull them off, they continue to shrink. And at where they're going is they're heading up towards the, nu the, the, the cell membrane to be released outside the cell. But basically the Golgi body is the final packaging system of all the proteins that they're being made in the endoplasmic reticulum to be released outside the cell. So the protein path goes something like this. It goes ribosomes, that's where the cell uh, makes the proteins. The endoplasmic reticulum, which might put different proteins together to a transport vesicle, which is just a little droplet um, uh, uh, that contains all the proteins in one place and it t carries them over to the Golgi body which does the final packaging and assembly when it goes to another vesicle and then it goes out to the cell membrane. Plant cells versus animal cells. Hopefully again, seventh grade, you learn the difference. There are some organelles. The, the centriole I just talked I talked about earlier is the only thing that is found in animal cells only that I know of. Um, organelles that are found only in plant cells are the cell wall, vacuoles, and plastids. All right, and you can see here the diagram, um, the two the two types of cells. This is this is a plant cell over here. This is an animal cell over here. All right, and you can see um, the plastids, which are the chloroplasts. You can see the vacuole, this large thing right here, and you can see the cell wall, which is the outermost layer on the cell. Um, other than that, you should actually be able to sell an animal cell from a plant cell because plant cells are very usually very uh, uh, geometric. They're, they're square or like I showed you those onion cells earlier. They have very defined, uh, well-defined shapes. Animal cells, because they're flexible, we can move, all right? We can't have a rigid cell. So they're more, they're more, uh, they're, not, they're not all similar. They all don't look the same, all right? The cell wall. Yeah, you, you probably kind of need to know this one. Um, it's found outside the cell membrane. So I don't know if you down, can see it down here. Um, you have the cell wall right here. And inside that cell wall is cell membrane. So if I were to draw that differently, you would have a cell wall here. Okay, so this, this right here is the cell wall. Cell wall. Wow, that's an M. That shouldn't be an F. Cell wall. All right. And then inside of that, you would have the cell membrane, which is very, very thin. Cell wall can be really thick. That's what the cell wall is, what allows a tree to stand up. A redwood tree to stand up 350 feet is the structure of the cell walls. And that structure is composed of, of cellulose. 
cellulose and water. Cellulose might sound familiar. We talked about it when we talked about um, uh, carbohydrates and I talked about polysaccharides. Cellulose is made of starch and um, but in arranged in, in chains, if I remember correctly. Um, and you don't need to know that, but it's arranged in chains, I think. Um, and, and it is um, a, a really tough uh, um, structure. And, and, but like I said, made out of glucose. If you're writing notes on paper right now, that entire piece of paper is made of cellulose taken from trees. All right. There are some animals that can actually chew on cellulose or eat cellulose and digest it. We don't, can't. We don't have the enzymes. Um, there are organisms that can, but they actually have to have a, a symbiotic relationship, which means they work with another organism like an amoeba or, some, or a protozoan that is able to digest it and break off the, the chains of glucose or the rings of glucose so that the organism can digest it. That's what cows and things like that or grazing animals can do. We don't have the capability of it, but the cell wall made of, uh, of cellulose. Polysaccharide. Probably should remember that. Class unit, remember? Okay. Vacuoles. Vacuoles are basically a membrane-bound sac, which is used for the storage of, of things like enzymes, food, pigments, water, waste products, and a whole lot of other things. Um, so, yeah, vacuoles. They're storage. They're, they're like the closet for the cell. All right. And then finally, there's plastids. And and the, the plastids that, that we talk about or, or are going to talk about real quickly here are chloroplasts, which are the most common. Okay. Um, they are green. That's what gives plants their green color is they have uh, a chloroplast. They're, they're green. All right. Uh, leucoplasts, which are, are white. You see them in potatoes. That's what a potato is. A lot of leucoplasts because they store starch. And the chromoplast is... Uh, stores uh, pigments and you see those in the fall uh, when leaves change colors you see the reds and the oranges and the yellows um, and and those are our chromoplast chromo meaning color leuco is white and chloro is green um, plastid means body okay just in case you want to know that um, yeah those are the the organelles containing the pigments only found in plants don't find them in, in uh, animals all right uh, a little closer look at the chloroplast, and we're going to take a look at this next unit more. Um, it contains these plate-like structures called grana, and uh, oh, just yeah, that one there. The grana, the, the plate-like structures. Um, the stroma is between them, and like it says, we give plants the green color. This is an electron microscope of uh, a photograph of a chloroplast from the side, I'm assuming, and then this actually down the bottom down here. These are actual uh, cells in a leaf or something, and every one of these little dots, these little green dots, is a chloroplast. All right, so basically if we saw the cell, it would look like this. We saw one chloroplast, so it would look like this over here. We looked at the chloroplast on the diagram, and over that kind of look, and then this is the final, what it what would look like. So that's cells, and again, you should have learned most of that in the seventh grade, but real quickly, um, just to make sure you got it all covered, you probably should know the difference between uh, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Again, don't worry about the history. That, that was the first part of the video. Don't need to worry about it. But uh, you should know the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are bacteria-type cells. Eukaryotic cells are cells. When I say the word cell, you think of a eukaryotic cell. You should know about the parts of the cell. Um, the, the cell membrane, which we're going to go in real detail uh, later on. Um, the cytoplasm, nucleus, the nucleolus, where the ribosomes are made, mitochondria, where ATP is made. ATP is a chemical that is a the battery uh, battery molecule it stores energy. Uh, the lysosomes, microfilaments, and microtubules give structure to the the cell. Um, you should know about uh, endoplasmic reticulum, the conveyor belt type thing where uh, uh, mostly proteins are assembled. Uh, Golgi bodies, where the the proteins are released to go outside the cell for extracellular proteins. If the ribosomes are inside the cell, in the cytoplasm, they're for inside the cell, cellular proteins. If they're attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, they're extracellular. Um, we, I'm probably missing a couple, just trying to make sure you cover a little bit. Um, we talked, uh, you should talk, know the difference between plant and animals. A centriole is the only, centriole is the only organ, organelle found in animal cells. And it is, uh, the, the function of that is it makes spindle fibers during cell division. Um, 
and in animal in plant cells in plant cells you have vacuoles which are storage organelles you have uh, uh, plastids which are the leucoplasts chloroplasts chromoplasts which are colored bodies and you have the cell wall which is made out of cellulose on its outside of the cell membranes outside the cell membrane all right i think that pretty much covers it if you have any questions please ask in class or uh, put it in the ed puzzle notes um, make sure that you you if you, you review your notes see if there's anything you don't understand uh, and let me know